Answering, answering the question, does Ecclesiastes 12.7, from a watchtower point of view, and Jehovah's Witnesses teach that we just cease to exist, and there's a time that we are in the dirt, in the waiting, God will then later resurrect us so we have no consciousness, no, we don't live on, or does this passage seem to indicate that we will die physically? But our spirit will go back to be with God who gave it, right? So this is what we're going to look at here in this particular um, article that was shared. So this was the article that was shared by the person in the email who asked a really good question pertaining to this. And this was uh, the link that was given to me on addressing this particular question. So this is coming from jw.org on one of their books brochures called Is This Life All There Is? All There Is, right? So I'm going to scroll down to the main part of where they're getting into what's happening because a lot here that they don't, they don't really focus so much on directly with Ecclesiastes 12.7. But here's the part where they get to most of it in this particular brochure from the Watcher. Okay, so let's read it together. How then does this invisible, impersonal force or spirit return to God? Does it return to his literal presence in heaven? The way in which the Bible uses the word return does not require that we, in each sense, think of an actual movement from one place to another. For instance, unfaithful Israelites were told, Return to me, and I will return to you, Jehovah of armies has said, reference to Malachi, uh, Malachi 3.7. Obviously, this did not mean that the Israelites were to leave the earth and come into the very presence of God. Obviously, wow, way to go, whoever was writing that for the Watchtower. Good job. Nor did it mean that God would leave his position in the heavens and begin dwelling on the earth with the Israelites. Wow, batting two for two. That's amazing. Good job. Rather, Israel's returning to Jehovah meant a turning around from a wrong course and again confronting or sorry, conforming to God's righteous way. And Jehovah's returning to Israel meant his turning favorable attention to his people once again. In both these cases, the return involved an attitude, not a literal movement from one geographical location to another. So they got that right. That part's going down. Good job. All right. We might as well stop this video. However, keep reading. That return... That the return of something does not require an actual movement might be illustrated by what happens in a transferal of a business or a property from the control of one party to another. For example, in a certain country, the control of the railroads might be shifted from the hands of private enterprise to those of the government. When such a transferal takes place, the railroad equipment and even all their records may maintain, so they may remain where they are. It is an authority over them that changes the hands. All right, granted, once again, not completely in error. So it is the case of the spirit. Now, now notice here's the shift. So it is the case of the spirit or the life force. So now they're trying to see the same comparison here. At death, no actual movement from the earth to the heavenly realm need occur for it to return to God. But the gift or grant of existence as an intelligent creature 
as enjoyed once by the dead person, now reverts to God. That which is needed to animate the person, namely the spirit or life force, is in God's hands. Now, it's interesting because they quote Luke 23, 46, where Jesus says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's Luke 23, 20, 46, right? Well, of course, Jesus said, Today, 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 you'll be with me in paradise. They might have, should have picked a different reference because that goes actually against you. Kind of funny. Um, the situation might be compared to that of an accused man, of an accused man who says to a judge, my life is in your hands. He means that what will become of his life rests with the judge. The accused has no choice in the matter. It is out of his hands. So no, sir. The situation might be compared to an accused man who says to the judge, my life is in your hands. He means that what will become of the rest of his, of his life or his life rests with the judge. The accused has no choice in the matter. It's out of his hands. Now, see, that's already wrong biblically. We do have choice. We were given a God-given choice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in the name of the only begotten is judged already. You see, we are given a choice in this matter. We do not have to stay in this condemned state. That's the goodness of the gospel. We can actually believe. I hope there's some amens out there. Similarly, in the case of a dead man, he does not have control over his spirit or his life force. That part, true. We don't have control of that part. That's right. It has returned to God in the sense, watch this, in the sense that he controls the future life prospects of the individual. Now we're really getting on a slippery slope here. It is up to God to decide as to whether he will restore the spirit or life force to the deceased. So here's where they struck out. They were two for two, you know, before, right? You know, they were doing well, and here's where they struck out. Similarly, in the case of a dead man, he does not have control of his spirit or his life force. It has returned to God in the sense that he controls the future life prospect of the individual. Now, granted, Based on God's sovereignty and God's grace, of course, God is the ultimate judge. Of course, whether we go to heaven or eternal judgment, we'll get to that in a little bit. That, of course, still in the end is God's, of course, you know, in the end, of course, right? But God's given us the opportunity, the availability, the gospel so that we could know Jesus now and have our sins forgiven now and know that we have eternal life now, right? Isn't that what 1 John 5.13 says? John says he's writing these Christians, I've written you that you who believe in Jesus, the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. And eternal life was in his name, the name of the only begotten Son, or the name of the only Son, Jesus Christ, right? We can know this now. That's the goodness of the gospel. Goes on to say again, it is up to God to decide as to whether he will restore the spirit or the life force to the sea. So this is where the works gets involved with 
the watchtower. This is where the works get involved with the watchtower, where they teach this fear, this control, how they can manipulate them to do certain things, to be involved in certain meetings, to do the street, street preaching, to be a part of different things so they can feel as if like their efforts are helping them get one step closer. I remember a little while back in where I live out here, I was doing some street witnessing. It's even one of my videos on my channel. I talked about it. I was talking with an elder, a Jehovah's Witness elder, and we talked about what it means to happen when we die. And can we know now we have eternal life before we die? And he said, no. He said, no, we can't. He says, but he hoped, his hope was that he was worthy of eternal life and the resurrection. He hoped he was worthy. I said, what do you mean worthy? That sounds like something you've got to do to earn God's approval. I said, that's the, that's the opposite of grace. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve eternal life. We don't deserve these things if we're all honest with ourselves, right? That's grace. Now, in the New World Translation, it says unmerited favor, blah, blah, blah. Grace. Grace is something given to us by God that we don't deserve if we trust in the gospel message that Christ died, gave his life an atoning sacrifice, rose again, and all who commit and trust in him and believe in him truly will become born again, a new creation, our spirits will become alive, and now we can know that we have eternal life. This is the manipulation of what the watchtower does to deceive, sadly, so many people. Goes on to say, but does this necessarily shut out all possibility of life after death? Is there not something else to consider? Then they go on talking about you know a bunch of mumbo jumbo about reincarnation and all that. It has nothing to do with this. Now, what I've done is I found some other articles that deal with the same subject. So still over here, which is a off link from the Watchtower, it's an official still website, wol.jw.org, when they have certain things that are not directly on their website directly. So if you notice, I put up here Ecclesiastes 12.7. I went through a different list. So here's one of them here called What Happens to the Soul at Death? And here's what they say here. Why then does Ecclesiastes 12, 7 state that when a person dies, the spirit itself returns to the true God who gave it? Does this mean that the spirit literally travels through space into God's presence? Notice the question here. Does this mean that the spirit literally travels through space, like beam me up, Scotty, right? Into, into God's presence. Well, actually, yeah. That's exactly it. Our spirits go directly to be in God's presence. Amen. Nothing of the sort is implied, they say. Remember, the spirit is the life force. Once that life force is gone, only God has the ability to restore it. Again, they're in the, of the doctrine that's false, the what's called soul sleep or annihilation of them. So they believe that when you die, your spirit, a life force is dead. Once that life force is gone, only God has the ability to restore it. So they're believing in this future. Hopefully they're thinking to be worthy, right? And again, any Jehovah's Witness listening, it's not your fault. You've been deceived by the watcher. They are the deceivers. Now, you are a deceiver going around teaching these false teachings, but you're doing it because it's what you've been taught. You need to repent, come out of the watchtower, and trust in what the Bible says that we're going to get to in just a little bit. goes on to say here, so the Spirit returns to the true God in the sense that any hope of future life for that person now rests entirely with God. So once again, notice this here. Once again, so the spirit returns to the true God in the sense 
that any hope of eternal life for that person now rests entirely with God. Now, again, I want to emphasize this. This is not what the Bible teaches of what the gospel is. Of course, God is the judge. God is righteous. God is holy. God is merciful. God is compassionate. But we are told in Scripture that if we know Jesus Christ now, we can know now that we are saved and have the gift of eternal life. In another resource, Watchtower 1999, April 1st, under the cover, What Does the Bible Say? Under paragraph 13, here's what it says on page 17. What then does it mean when Ecclesiastes 12, 7 states that when a person dies, the spirit itself returns to the true God who gave it. So notice the same type of questions, same type of wording, nothing really different. Does this mean that the spirit literally travels through the space in God's presence? So again, this is the same, same one, right? Same one, right? Same one as they're saying over here. Very similar, very similar. Nothing is stored in place. Since the spirit is the life force, it returns to the true God in the sense of any, any hope, future life, that person now rests entirely with God. Notice the additional part here. Only God can restore the spirit or the life force causing a person to come back to life. Okay? So only God can restore, right? And notice it says Psalm 104, verse 30, right? Now, in their New World Translation, they completely butchered this text. Go read almost any other translation, and you'll see an accurate rendering of this, because they completely twist what this says. In fact, let's just go click on it real quick, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So here's what it says on their other one here. If you send out your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face surface of the ground. Now, even still, even still, if you send out your spirit, what's that? God's spirit, right? So here it says they are created. And you renew the surface of the ground. Well, actually what's going on here, this is not talking about later on in a restoration of being annihilated and then brought back to life. This is talking about creation itself, right? Here it talks about here, few food in due season. Open up your hand, they're satisfied. You hide your faith, they're just made. You take away their spirit, they expire, they return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. You send forth your spirit, they are created. This is talking about when we come into existence and the Holy Spirit, He is involved with our creation it goes back to the book of Genesis, right? Remember Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it goes talking about the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Genesis one twenty six, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The Holy spirit was involved. We also know the father and the whole, and Jesus are involved. First Corinthians eight, six, John one, three, Colossians one, 16 to 17. So here, this is pointing to, the Trinity, right? This is pointing to the Trinity. So here, notice again what they say, though, just to highlight this one more time. Since the Spirit is the life force, it returns to the true God in the sense that any hope of the future life of that person now rests entirely with God. So again, they're putting this stress of works hoping that they can get this point of quote-unquote worthiness. Only God can restore the spirit or life force causing the person to come back to life. So they take Psalm 104, verse 30 out of context, and again, twist the scriptures here to fit their understanding. One more. Watchtower, 1999, April 15th. Page 30, 
Again, a question being asked on Ecclesiastes 12.7. How does the Spirit return to God when a person dies? They say, since the Spirit is the life force, it returns to the true God in the sense that any hope of future life for that person now rests entirely with God. So once again, we see this repetitiveness. They really have no imagination or no creativity. It's the same broken, not one-hit wonder. Only God can restore the spirit, life force, causing the person to come back to life. So notice that they keep on saying the same broken record, the same broken record, right? So then how do we respond as Christians and want to help Jehovah's Witnesses actually see that, yes, when we die, our spirit does go on, that we do live on. As Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed for man to live once and then to die then once, and then judgment. So we will be judged when we die. How are we judged? We are judged based on what we did with Jesus Christ. You either know Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the Bible, you've either been set free, your sins have been atoned for through his shed blood, dying upon the cross, yes, it was a cross, and he was resurrected, defeat and sin and death, and you put your complete trust in him alone, not works, not a denomination, not church fathers, not Oprah, not anyone else out there. It's in Jesus Christ alone. And if you have that hope, as we read in Scripture over and over and over, you can know you have eternal. And you don't have to hope by what you do in certain things that you would be quote unquote worthy in the resurrection, right? So let's look at some scriptures, even though they are twisted, let's look at what the New World Translation has to say from both a believer's point of view and a non-believer's point of view from the New Testament. Are we ready? Jehovah's Witnesses, JW.org, this is a 2013 edition, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. What do we see Paul teaching in verses 21 through 23 in regards to him? What happens to him when he dies? What is Paul's hope when he dies as a Christian? Does he think that if he was to die, he's going to cease to exist? Nothing happening? Does he have the hope that when he dies, that he would be with the Lord? What is, hope? what is his hope that he teaches for us as Christians when we die? Where will where, where our home be when we die in this body? Where will we go when we die? Even in the New World Translation, though it's not as accurate as it should be when you read another translation, King James, New King James, New American Standard, it's much more accurately translated. But still, you can still get the gist out of this, the thrust, if you will, of what this is teaching, okay? Paul says, again, New World Translation, for in my case, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We need an amen out there. Paul knows that if he dies, it's gain. He's not worried about it. Oh, but Paul is a super Christian, right? No, remember Romans 7? He said he was a sinner. He was a scumbucket. The sin that he wished he wouldn't do, he still does. The thing that he wished he would do, he doesn't do. He's just like us. He's not walking on water. He's a sinner like all of us. But Paul knew that his hope was in Christ, that when he died, it was gain. He says, now if I am to live on in the flesh, this is the fruitage or fruit of my work. Yet, what I would choose. You mean you have a choice? Paul, what are you thinking? You, you, got, you got some cahoot. You got choice? What are you thinking, man? Yet, what would I choose? Well, let me think about it. 
All right, hold on, hold on. All right, everybody. You know, I've been thinking lately. You know, I'm living right now. But man, if I die, I just go to the dirt. And I'm going to be probably there for a few thousand years, a couple thousand years. Who knows? It's going to be a really long time. Which do I want to do? Think about it. <laughs> right? He's not. That's just silly. He says, now if I'm to live on the flesh, this is fruit of my work. Yet, what would I choose? I do not make known. I am torn. He says, I am torn. Paul was torn. Why would he be torn? Because he realizes, according to what he just said, fruit. Fruit. What was the fruit? He was being there with the Christians, helping them grow in the faith. He says, but if I'm torn, I either keep doing this or I go to the dirt and cease to exist. Which is better? Yikes. No, it's not at all what he's teaching. He says, I'm torn between these two things. For I desire the releasing or depart and be in with Christ. Being present tense. And the being present tense with Christ. Present tense. It says depart and be with Christ is a more accurate translation. But still, even in their New World translation, being is still present tense. Which is, to be sure, far better. Can we get an amen? Yes, it is to be with Christ is far better. That's amazing. And where is Jesus Christ? He's in heaven. That's where our home would be, with the Lord. Paul knew exactly where he was going to be when he died with Christ. He said, however, it is more necessary for me to remain in the flesh for your sakes. That's why he says, he says, in my case, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So to live is Christ, meaning to press on, keep on doing it. But to die is gain. Why? Because he's going to go be with Christ. He then says, now if I'm to live on the flesh, this is fruitage or fruit of my work, meaning to be with them, to help them. Why? For their sakes. Why? To help them grow. He says this, though. What would I choose? Paul, what kind of stupid statement is that? What do you mean I choose? You keep on living or you go to the dirt. You keep on living in this world. You got stuff going on. Yay. Or you go to the dirt. That's stupid to even think like that. No offense. And what I just said to any particular Jehovah witness, but that's just stupid to think that. He says, I am torn between these two things. I am torn. It means he's, just, he's like, okay, I know I want to go be with Jesus right now. Yes. Don't we all say the same thing? Isn't that the hope of all of us Christians in this world? We want to depart and be with Christ. Amen. There's no death. There's no suffering. There's no sickness. There's joy above and beyond that we'll ever even imagine of what it will be like. I mean, come on. That's the greatest of all things. He says, I'm torn between these two things. For the desire to release or to depart and be with Christ or being with Christ, which is, to be sure, Far better. Amen. But he says, it's necessary for your sake. For me. So according to Paul, as a Christian who was a sinner, even called himself the chief of sinners in another place, I think it's 1 Timothy 1.15, if I remember correctly, he also said in Romans, I said earlier, he is a scumbucket, just like all of us. He was still sinning at times, whatever it was. He had a struggle, and he acknowledged it. And he's saved by grace. He says in Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul, again, reading from the New World Translation, so have to be cautious with how this is going to be worded, okay? But still, nonetheless, you can still get the gist, the thrust of the context that refutes the false teachings 
of what the Wash Hour still teaches. For we know that if our earthly house, meaning this what we have right now, this tent should be torn down, we are to have a building from God, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the heavens. So this other home, this other building, not made with hands, not of this physical realm, but in the heavenly realm and is everlasting. For in this house, we do indeed grow. In this house, the one we're in right now, this earthly tent, earnestly desiring to put on the one for us from heaven. We are earnestly desiring. This sounds exactly like what we just read in Philippians chapter one. Earnestly desire to put on the one for us from heaven. This is something we are looking forward to. So that when we do not, so that when we do put it on, we will be not found naked. In fact, we who are in this tent groan, being weighed down, because we do not want to put this one off but we want to put the other one on so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who is, who has, now the one who prepared us for this very thing is God who gave us the spirit as a token of what is to come. God gave us a spirit. Now the witnesses don't believe that we actually have the Holy spirit dwelling within us. They don't understand that. They don't understand that concept that when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, right? But what it goes on to say here, look at verses 6 through 9 specifically, but we'll get to 10 as well. Paul says this, so we Christians are always of good courage and know that while we Christians have our home in the body right now. We are absent from the Lord. Notice the context right now in this body we have physically. We are walking by faith, not by sight, but we are of good courage. Watch this now, watch the shift. But we are of good courage and would prefer. Amen to be absent from the body and to make our home with the Lord. So whether at home with him or absent from him, we make it our aim to be acceptable to him. And amen, as of course, a way of life. Absolutely. But notice here, Paul, again, now includes others. It's not just Paul. Christians, to be absent from the body is what? to be present with the Lord, to be absent from this body, we are home will be with the Lord. This is what scripture teaches, Philippians 1, 21 through 24, and here again, to always be of good courage, know that while we have our home in this body, we are absent from the Lord, for we are walking by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage and would prefer to be absent from the body and to make our home with the Lord. This is not hoping a thousand and thousand and thousand of years later and that one day we'll be resurrected and all of a sudden hoping to be worthy. That is not at all what Paul taught the Christians. So whether at home with him or absent from him, we will we make it our acceptable aim, our aim to be acceptable to him. Then he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each man, each, sorry, each may be repaid according to the things he practiced while in the body, whether good or bad. So as Christians, we will be at the seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ at some point in the future. Yes, however that all works out. And we will be judged based on certain things we've done. But here's the good news. If you are in Christ, you are not condemned. If you are in Christ, you don't have eternal judgment or damnation or annihilation. You will still be in the very presence of God. That doesn't get taken away. But how it works in the afterlife, there is certain things that we will be judged for, what we've done good and bad. And for Christians, we go to the judgment seat of Christ. However, those who are not Christians go 
somewhere else. In Revelation chapter 20, again, New World Translation, so that I am not being accused of using a biased translation. Notice here the context here. Revelation 20 talks about dragon, the devil, Satan, right? He's bound up for a thousand years, years, not getting all in eschatology right now, but he's bound up, however it all works out. Then he's released for a little while. It says there's going to be a, another battle, however all that works. Talks about thrones and those who sat on them, given authority to judge. Yes, so the souls, those who were executed, they were a witness. They gave it about Jesus and for speaking about God and those who had not worshipped the wild beast. That's the Antichrist. The wild beast is the Antichrist. And its image, it had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and ruled with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years later. This is talking about certain things coming after the first resurrection. It says, happy and holy is anyone who has the first part in the first resurrection. So there's order in the first and second resurrection. Has no authority, but they'll be priests of God and of Christ, and they will be ruled as kings with him for a thousand years. As soon as the thousand years have ended, Satan will be released from his prison, go about and mislead the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, gather them together for the war. The number of these is the sand of the sea. Now, here's what I wanted to get to. What happens when a person who doesn't know the Lord, or who is against God, what happens in their eternal state? Notice what we see in verse 10. This is what I wanted. I want to read all that to this. This is the main point that demonstrates why soul sleep, according to what the Watchtower teaches, according to what Seven Day Adventist teaches, or other people out there that are false teachers. The devil, it says here, Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who was misleading them was hurled into the lake of fire. Okay, now the devil is an angelic being. Okay. Okay, okay. Maybe he's got eternal damnation. Maybe he's he's the he's an exception. He's the rule. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Hurled in the lake of fire. But watch this. This is so pay attention, guys. This is good. The devil, after all this takes place, these different resurrections, judgment, thousand years. We don't completely all understand all of that, right? However, it pans out. But watch this. The devil who was misleading them was hurled or thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. Okay? So this is his judgment now. Where both the wild beast, Antichrist, just so you know, and false prophet already were. The Antichrist and the false prophet during the Great Tribulation were already and still in the lake of fire. Do you see that? This is in the New World Translation, friends. Any of your witnesses listening, you cannot deny this. Where the wild beast and the false prophet already were. If they were annihilated, cease to exist, they wouldn't be alive. They wouldn't be around. This would make absolutely no sense. Now notice the Antichrist and the false prophet, just an additional extra credit nugget here, they're humans, just like us. Unless you're a cat or a dog watcher right now and you click the button and you're, you know, your owner's not paying attention. And hey, you need Jesus too. My cats have been saved. It's good. So the wild beast and the false prophet already were. They're in the lake of fire. Now watch this. And they, who's the they? Who's the they, friends? The devil? The Antichrist? And the false prophet? They were will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. What? What? Wait a minute. I thought the Watchtower taught that they were the only true channel, organization of God on this earth, and only 
The 144,000 can give us the spiritual food that we need to understand the Bible because nobody can actually understand the Bible properly without the Watchtower's publications and the authority of the Watchtower as being the faithful and discreet slave. And they teach that we die and cease to exist and there's no judgment eternal afterwards. But here it says they will be tormented day and night forever. And that's the Antichrist, the false prophet, who are humans. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? Well, I agree with that. That's what I do with that. Because that's what the Bible teaches. So annihilationism is false. Soul sleep is false. And those who teach those things are teaching false teachings. Now watch this. So the false prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan are now hurled. Well, Satan's hurled later. Antichrist and the false prophet are already there. So they've been there for a while, friends. It's been a thousand years after the Great Tribulation. However all that works, if we believe in a thousand literal, I do, but whatever. They've been there for a while. We'll just give it that, okay? And they're still alive, okay? And they're now going to be judged day and night forever. Okay, okay, okay. That doesn't mean other people are going to be right, Kelly. That's just those guys, right? Wrong. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. This is different than 2 Corinthians 5.10, as I was talking about before. This judgment now is for non-believers here. Watch. I saw a great white throne and the one seated on it. From before him, the earth and the heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The scrolls were open, but another scroll was open. It was the scroll of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the scrolls according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead in them, and the death, death, and, death in the grave gave up the dead in them. And they were judged individually according to their deeds. Now, granted, okay. Okay, maybe you're for a little bit sleeping. I don't believe that. That's not what this is teaching. But this, let, let's say it was true. Let's say for the sake of it, Okay, you cease to exist, some of you out there, even though the false prophet, the Antichrist, they've been in the lake of fire the whole time, so I don't know what to tell you about that. But in the context here, the dead, I mean those who have dead, died, now they come out, this is imagery, right? But watch this. These are real people. This is real consequence. And it says this, death and the grave were hurled in the lake of fire. So this is just like the devil was in... 2010, which says the devil who was misleading them was hurled in the lake of fire where both the Antichrist, the wild beast, and the false prophet all ready were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay? Okay. Death and the grave were hurled into the lake of fire. This means the second death, the lake of fire. Here's the clincher, friends. And if you're a witness, if you're a seven-day Adventist or anyone else out there believing in soul sleep, you need to repent. Trust in the biblical Jesus Christ of the Bible, not the one of the Watchtower, not the one of other movements out there, but the Bible, the biblical Jesus, and the biblical gospel that you can know you have eternal life right now by trusting truly in Jesus Christ, not your works, not Torah-keeping, not certain organization or religion or whatever else, but in Jesus Christ alone. His debt paid the debt that you can never pay. That's why we're saved by grace. Trust in him. Furthermore, verse 15, verse 15, whoever, say whoever, out loud or write down, whatever you want to say, say it out loud, whoever was not found written in the book of life was hurled, right? Into the lake of fire, lake of fire. So we have passages here. So whoever was not found written in the book of life was hurled in the lake of fire. What do we see the consequences of those who are in the lake of fire according to Revelation 20, verse 10? The devil, who was misleading them, was hurled, thrown into the lake of fire, lake and sulfur, where doth the Antichrist, the wild beast, I love that. He's a wild man. And the false prophet already were. 
and they will be not they'll cease to exist not they'll have no more consciousness not the forever sleep like in star wars not going to happen they will be tormented day and night forever and ever this is what even in the new world translation teaches this is what the new world translation teaches so if you are a jehovah's witness you seriously need to turn from what the watchtower has taught you now make no mistake about it i'm going to share an example with you from matthew 26 that completely utterly crushes the view that we have soul sleep or annihilationism or that kind of mumbo jumbo okay again this is specifically for jehovah's witnesses so i'm using the new world translation once again as you can see on your screen from jw.org matthew 26 i'm going to start in verse 17 on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to so-and-so. <laughs> Go find so-and-so. All right. And say to him, The teacher says. You ever met someone called, Hey, so-and-so. Yeah, you. No, you, yeah, you, you're so-and-so. You're so-and-so, right? All right. The teacher says, my appointed time is near, and I will celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your home. So the disciples did as Jesus instructed them and prepared for the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the 12 disciples. While they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, we already know that Peter later was going to be denying Jesus. But here, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. There's a difference. Being very much grieved at this, each and every one began to say to them, so this would be quite disturbing. You've been now told that one of the 12, who is the 12 apostles whom Jesus chose, is now going to betray him. This must have caused a little bit of an uproar. So we see, being very much grieved at this, verse 22, each and every one began to say to them, Lord, is it not I, is it? So they were concerned because, I mean, they, Jesus has been doing miracles, signs and wonders, healing people, raising the dead, speaking things in the future that went, wow, that really happened. So he's, he's somebody to reckon with. He's somebody to listen to, right? So they're like, wow, this is not good. I hope it's not me. In reply, he said, the one who dips his hand with me into the bowl is the one who will betray me. So now he gives specific what's going to happen and who it's going to be, he says, right? Verse 24. True, the Son of Man is going away, just as is written about him. But woe. Notice here the woe. But woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. He's, this is not exciting words now, friends. This betrayal is, is even bigger than what he originally said. Woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Look at the end of verse 24. 
it would have been better. It would have been better. It would have been better for that man if he had not, not, not been born. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who was about to betray him, replied, It is not I, is it, Rabbi? Notice he always calls him Rabbi. He never truly acknowledged who, who Christ truly was. Jesus said to him, You, yourself, said it. This is Judas Iscariot that we also know in John chapter 6 that Jesus said, I've chosen you, yet one of you is a devil. Crazy, right? Crazy. Now, why do I bring this verse up? What is the point of sharing this particular verse? Jesus said it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Now, listen up. Any Jehovah Witnesses that might be listening or any Seventh-day Adventists or anyone else out there that has a certain soul sleep still, annihilation sleep. If you're still listening and you still have that view, what's wrong with you? It's just not there. If annihilation is true, if soul sleep is true, to which we cease to exist, we no longer have consciousness. We remember nothing. We just cease. And guess what? You don't remember Jack. You remember nothing. You're, you're done. You're erased. Like in movies. You've been erased, right? Like when you delete something. You, delete, you, know, you throw it into your, your computer and you throw it in your little you know, trash box. Delete. Gone, right? It's done. Right? Gone. Done. Jesus said here it would have been better if that man had not been born. If we don't have, as we just read in Revelation 20, eternal consequences for those who are not of God, those who have not had their names written in the book of life. And there's actually eternal judgment, torment, day and night forever in the lake of fire then him, Jesus saying it would have been better if he'd never been born makes literally no sense. Because if he would have never been born, guess what? He would have never known it. Why? Because he never was in existence. Oh, wait a minute. But then if he dies and ceases to exist, he never knew that either. He's just done. You get the point? It makes no sense. This demonstrates that there is, is, eternal, some type of judgment. We do not cease to exist. Soul sleep is completely and unequivocally unbiblical, and it is not what the Bible teaches. Let me give you one more that I didn't have as I was going through this here, one more scripture that we can share with confidence with confidence. First John chapter five. Again, New World Translation. So the one who believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who was sent from the Father, the one who died upon the cross, the one that we know was resurrected. This is the John that we read from the Gospel of John and his epistle, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And as he concludes, towards the end of this chapter in chapter 5, he says the following, verses 10 through 13. Writing to Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, the one of Bible. 
the person putting his faith in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The person having faith in God has, the person not having faith in God has made him a liar because he has not put his faith in the witness given by God concerning his Son. And this is the witness that God gave us, gave us, gave us everlasting life. Not in the future. This is something they already have. And this life, what's that? Everlasting life. And this life is in his son. The one who has the son has this life. What life? Everlasting life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have this life. What's that? Does not have everlasting life. What's the opposite? Well, we just read through it. Revelation 20, Judas Iscariot, Matthew 26. Don't be on that page. Be on this page. The one who has the Son has this life, everlasting life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have this life. That's not good. Now, for those of you who do, or for those of you who want to put your trust in Jesus Christ now, and know now that you can be saved now, you can have eternal. Now you can have your sins forgiven. Now no condemnation. Now you can know that you don't have to try to be worthy, to do good works, to be a part of a certain organization, a certain church, a certain denomination, or whatever else that may be out there you want to be a part of. All those are the wide road that leads to destruction. You want to be on the narrow path. You want to be in the way that leads that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. That's the one you want to be with. That's the one that's going to be getting you into heaven, in eternal life, forever. Any other way? Any other way you try to get in? Built on sand. Sand. John writes to the Christians. So we say it together as Christians in here, amen and amen. I write to you these things so that you may know. Amen. Know what? What, John? What can we know? I write these things so that you may know. Know what, John? That you have, have, have life everlasting. You, whoever you are listening right now, who've put your complete trust in Jesus Christ by faith in who he is and what he did for you on the cross and the resurrection, you who put your faith in the name of the Son of God, if you do that, friends, you can know you have everlasting life, and you don't have to worry about what happens when you die physically. You can know it now. Not because of your goodness, not because of works, not because you're someone special, but because of God's grace, and you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the one that came, fulfilling biblical prophecy. Amen.